Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome. My name is Matt McKenzie. I'm the chair of the Department of Philosophy here at Colorado State University. And on behalf of the Department of Philosophy, I'd like to welcome you to our third uh, Modocan Spring Lecture. And before I introduce our distinguished guest, uh, I'd first like to thank uh, Bruce Modocan, who unfortunately couldn't be here with us this evening, but I'd like to thank him for his uh, generous support of the Modocan uh, Symposium Series. We do workshops in the fall, and we do uh, the Distinguished Lecture Series uh, in the spring. So thank you to Bruce uh, for his support. Um, and our speaker tonight uh, is Dr. Jennifer Lackey. Uh, she is the Wayne and Elizabeth Jones Professor of Philosophy at Northwestern University and the Director of the Northwestern Prison Education Program. She specializes in epistemology, with a particular emphasis on a broad range of issues in social epistemology. And her recent work focuses on false confessions, the criminal justice system, the duty to object, norms of credibility, the epistemic status of punishment, the epistemology of groups, expertise, and the distribution of epistemic limits. Uh, she has a, a long and distinguished record of scholarly publications, including learning from words, testimony as a source of knowledge, and a co-edited book co-authored book, The Epistemology of Testimony, uh, as well as The Epistemology of Disagreement, uh, a volume on academic freedom, and essays in collective epistemology. So please join me in welcoming Professor Jennifer. that is repeated and reinforced 
thereby amplifying it, often through resharing it. Okay, so typically we talk about online echo chambers. Okay, um, and so it would be you know kind of tweeting or sharing on Facebook or something like that. And this occurs in an enclosed system or chamber, such as a social network, so that the opinion is allowed to echo. And dissenting voices are either altogether absent or they're drowned out. Okay, so those are really taken to be the three standard features. So fears from Jameson and Capella abounded in closed space that has the potential to both magnify the message to, messages delivered within it and insulate them from rebuttal. Okay. Robeson, the accepted view of a group, and particularly its opinion leaders, is frequently repeated and reinforced while dissenting views, if they are present at all, are drowned or ignored. They are, in some respect, be it geographical, cultural, or otherwise enclosed spaces, and the judgments of opinion leaders are not merely transmitted, but also amplified. So these are just some classic conceptions of um, echo chamber. Now, when we say that someone is in an echo chamber, this is not a value-neutral claim, right? It's not as though we're like, oh, Trump is in an echo chamber. Well, is that a good echo chamber or a bad echo chamber, right? This is a criticism. When all of the news networks are like kind of having this as their headline, it's taken to be a criticism. There is a problem here, and typically there's a distinctively epistemic problem. So by epistemic, that is um, typically associated with epistemology, which is the study of knowledge. And when people say that something is an epistemic problem, what they mean is it's a problem in the pursuit of truth or knowledge. Okay? So it's not necessarily a moral criticism by itself, right? I mean, I don't know, someone might say that like, being in a technical chamber might be, might be morally neutral. But typically, when people say someone is in an echo chamber, it's an epistemic criticism. In the sense of, to the extent that we have the goals of truth or knowledge, being in an echo chamber is a bad thing. Now, it's interesting because actually when you look at the literature on echo chambers, particularly in popular discussions, there is an, a, a, a striking absence of a diagnosis of what is wrong with being in an echo chamber. Okay, what exactly is problematic? We saw the description of it, right? Dissenting voices are drowned out. You know, voices that agree with you are kind of amplified. So what exactly is the problem with being in an echo chamber? Okay, so what I want to do is go through a couple of potential candidates for what's a problem, what's problematic with them, and um, then I want to suggest something, um, I think a more kind of neutral understanding so I think the, the, the very initial diagnosis is that there is problematic dependence, okay? So um, oftentimes when people talk about being in an echo chamber, there's like an original source, okay? And then everybody is just repeating that, okay? So typically when you hear from one person that a restaurant is good, that would have less weight for you than if 15 people told you that the restaurant is good, okay? But what if you found out that all 15 people heard from the first person that the restaurant is good? That would change your attitude about how significant <coughs> those 15 voices are, okay? And Wittgenstein, who is a pretty well-known philosopher, gives this well-known example where I think that at work in his example is sort of what people have in mind when they're thinking about echo chambers. He said, it would be like trying to increase your evidence for believing something by reading 15 copies of the same issue of the New York Times. Okay? I've heard it 15 different times, but it's all from the same single source. Okay? And so there's a problematic dependence on this diagnosis because you go online, and you see, oh my gosh, this was shared by 200,000 people. Whoa, 200,000 Americans seem to be agreeing with this point, okay? And so, um, by virtue of looking at that, it looks like it has more support than it in fact does. The problem that this is is a familiar one in um, the area of philosophy that I tend to work on in social so um, there's a big um, area of epistemology that's super relevant to this topic as well because people are really connecting it up with like a political domain, and that's how should we respond to disagreement, 
right? What should our response be to the amount of disagreement we find in the public sphere today? And it's pretty standardly said in the, in the, the literature that um, you only should revise your view in the face of disagreement if those dissenting views are independent of one another. And that's just taken to be a standard view, right? So here's Tom Kelly saying, even in cases in which opinion is sharply divided among a large number of generally reliable individuals, it would be a mistake to be impressed by the sheer number of such individuals on both sides of the issue. Numbers mean little in the absence of independence. So this is like the 15 people who recommend the restaurant, but all, you know, all 15 of them heard it from the original source. Similarly, at an Alba, an additional outside opinion should move one only to the extent that one counts it as independent from opinions one has already taken into account. Such a thesis, he claims, is completely uncontroversial, and every sensible view on disagreement should accommodate it. So the thesis is this. The opinions of others have epistemic force, meaning force related to truth or knowledge, only to the extent that they are independent of one another. Okay? So you ought to be compelled by those 15 people who recommend that restaurant to you only to the extent that those 15 opinions are independent. Okay? And so this understanding of what's going on with echo chambers is that there's a tremendous amount of dependence, right? Because they're in an enclosed system, okay? People are repeating things that they heard from the same sources, okay? Um, and yet, there's this appearance of tremendous support. So a very plausible online version of Wittgenstein's newspaper example would imagine, like, suppose you have like 200 people on a social media kind of um, site, and they all you know, kind of are posting why Brexit is a mistake, but each one of them is simply repeating what they read in the Guardian. So the standard view of echo chambers would say that the number of voices commenting on Brexit being a mistake is just one. Okay, if they all ultimately reduce to the Guardian and they're believing it just because the Guardian said it, then 200,000 shares ultimately just reduces to one. And this is part of the problem. Echo chambers give this appearance of tremendous support when in fact it belies very, very limited support. Okay? So that's one objection, that we, one diagnosis we might have of what's specifically problematic, epistemically problematic with the echo chamber. But I want to suggest that this is not right. I actually think it's wrong in the epistemology of history. Remember when Alvis said that he was so uncontroversial that like every view should accommodate it? I actually think the thesis is false. Okay. So not only do I think it's controversial, I think it's false. <clears throat> okay, so um, here's why. Okay, so I want to suggest that typically, and this is going to become pretty significant later on in the, in the talk. So I want to suggest that for most of us, we engage in what I call autonomous dependence. Okay? Now, autonomous dependence comes in degrees. Okay? But autonomous dependence involves these sorts of features. Okay? When you're online and you're consuming your news, right? I want to suggest that most of us in this room, maybe even all of us in this room, do so in the following sort of way. So you're monitoring the incoming testimony for counter evidence. You're monitoring it for something that is at odds with something you already know to be true, right? So suppose that you take it to be true and you feel like you've got really good evidence for, um, you know, kind of climate change being connected with human activity, okay? And then you're reading your online consumption of news and boom, they say something about it not being connected at all to, to, to human activity. Well, presumably you're monitoring the incoming testimony. You're, you're monitoring your incoming information. Most of us possess beliefs about the reliability and trustworthiness of our sources. I would imagine that most people in this room have beliefs about your go-to sources, right? And your beliefs about the sources you avoid, okay? I don't care what they are, but you have beliefs about them, right? And presumably, you gravitate towards the ones that you think are giving you true information, okay? And also, as humans, when we assert something, and there's all sorts of debates, I don't need to get into all of this today. If you want to talk about this during the Q&A, I'm happy to, but there's actually debates about whether shares and retweets 
our assertions and whether they are assenting and how we should interpret these. And these are in question, these are important questions as much more of our life ends up online. But I'm going to try to bypass that. Um, for the purposes of what I want to suggest right now is just that um, by virtue of us espousing something, we're assuming some sort of responsibility for it. If you assert something, if you share something, it seems legitimate for someone to say, wait a minute, are you are you asserting that? Are you taking responsibility for that? And all of these features, I want to say, are part of autonomous dependence. Okay, so let's go back to the Brexit case. Now, the standard view is that if 200 people post it, the problem is that reduces to one source, namely the source of guardian. And I want to suggest that this is false. Okay? If 200 people autonomously endorse the view, that means that it filter, filtered through 200 different sets of beliefs. Each human in this room has a different set of beliefs. And each one of us has different bodies of counter evidence that we bring to the table when we read the news. If 200 of us endorse something, then that means that it passed through 200 of our sets of beliefs. right? And that is not reducible to a single source. So this idea that it's uncontroversial, that beliefs have force only to the extent that they're independent of one another, I want to suggest is false. Okay? There can be a lot of dependence. All 200 of us might have gotten our original belief from the Guardian. But if all 200 of us autonomously took on this belief, then that has additional support because they got filtered through 200 different sets of beliefs. Okay, okay so um, people always say, well, this is all well and good. Okay, it's all well and good that you've got this notion of autonomous dependence, but people in echo chambers are like this. Okay, and that's why dependence is a problem. People in echo chambers are not kind of assessing reliability and you know keeping an eye out for counter evidence and so on. Instead, they're much more like this concept that Alvin Goldman has put at work with respect to expertise. So he is interested in this notion when he's saying, how do you decide between two experts who give conflicting information? Okay? And he invokes this notion of what he calls non-independence. Okay? And so non-independence is where you are just as likely to follow what somebody says, regardless of whether it's true or false. Okay? So I think a really classic example here might be how some people, some people's attitudes towards the Pope. So some people take it that qua Catholic, they have to believe whatever the Pope asserts, right? Or as a, you know, a papal degree. And so they're not sensitive to the truth value of what the Pope is saying. It's just the Pope said this, and so I'm going to take it on. And in such a case, Goldman is going to say, such a person is a non-discriminating reflector, meaning that you've got this source, and you just reflect what that person says okay? in a non-discriminating way. And when two or more people are non-discriminating in this sort of way, Goldman says, we shouldn't be swayed even a tiny bit by more than one of these opinions. Because there's no sensitivity to the truth, right? You're just reflecting what someone else says, right? And so on this view, um, most of those in the echo chambers are non-independent in this sort of way, right? On this view, really what's happening is that there are sort of like these kind of guru-type figures, right, or political figures. People aren't being discriminated. They're just reflecting what these figures are saying. Um, the Pope might not be the most like timely example for, I mean, for us when we think about these kinds of issues of online consumption, probably what it would be like is political figures, right? People are going to throw their support behind a political figure, and they're not really reflecting the truth value. They're not discriminating on the basis of truth or falsity. They're just reflecting what this political leader is saying. But I want to suggest that even on this model, this is not what kind of ordinary consumers of information are doing. Think about it on this way. On this view, to be a non-discriminating reflector, you would have to accept what someone says, regardless of whether they say that cockatiels are mammals rather than birds, that onion rings are healthier than broccoli, that the earth is under rather than over 100 years old. You'd have to believe whatever the source says. That's what a non-discriminating reflector is. It just repeats as like a parrot. Okay. And I want to suggest that this is not 
what is happening. Even if Democrats are very likely to accept the CNN reports, and Republicans are disclosed are disclosed to Fox, there are surely epistemic limits, right, to what um, either of them is going to say. I mean, think about like, um, you know, if, um, you know, like a Democrat leader all of a sudden said like, we really should kind of like loosen gun laws, for instance, right? It wouldn't just be like, well, the Democrats said that, so we're going to put our weight behind that, and vice versa, right? Um, so I just don't think that this is the right sort of analysis of what's going on. <clears throat> There's a further problem that I think people don't think enough about when they talk about echo chambers. And that is how we got into the echo chamber. Right? And I'm just going to a little bit of time, I think this is going to become a little more salient in a little bit. Okay. So even if someone just in a non-discriminating way reflects what someone else says, there's an important difference between doing a lot of work to trust that source and just ending up with that source like through a, through a flip of a coin. So suppose you do a ton of research and you realize that like the Journal of Climatology is the best source on information about the climate, about climate change. And after you do all of that research, you just accept what you're told from that journal without reassessing its trustworthiness. That's different than me going into a library and just choosing something at random and being a, and just reflect, you know, kind of, you know, believing anything that they're told. So this is another way in which people say, like, oh, so and so's in an echo chamber, so and so's in an echo chamber, so and so's. And one of the questions we need to ask is, well, how did they get there in the first place, right? Was it through a lot of research that someone said, I now am going to just believe NPR, right? I've done my homework, I realize that this is the best source of news, and now I'm going to trust what I'm told, um, versus not doing. So I don't think a lack of dependence can be, a lack of interdependence can be what's out there. So Cass Sunstein is the most cited legal scholar in the world. Okay. And he has written a ton of books arguing for very similar theses, a lot of them. And his most recent is from 2017, where he is again arguing that in, so this is right out of the gate, he says, in a well-functioning democracy, People do not live in echo chambers or information cocoons. Okay? So that's the start of the book. And he is arguing that not being in echo chambers is essential for democracy. Okay? So what he argues on um, Sunstein is that there is intrinsic value to just a diversity of movements. Just the diversity itself has epistemic value. And he appeals to you know, some work like John Dewey, and he centers a lot of his arguments on the work of John Stuart Mill. Okay? In John Stuart Mill's arguments for the epistemic virtue of free speech. Why do we care about free speech? Why do we privilege it when people can say horrible things? Right? People can say horribly hurtful things, vicious things, right? And yet we still think that people ought to be able to do that. We put a very big premium on free speech. And John Stuart Mill gives us a number of arguments, but he gives us four specifically epistemic arguments for why free speech is valuable. Okay? So the first one he says is we are fallible. And so because of our fallibility, we have to be open to the possibility that an opinion that deviates from the mainstream is true. As he says, if any opinion is compelled to silence, that opinion may, for aught we can certainly know, be true. To deny this is to assume our own infallibility. Okay? So our fallibility requires that we are open to the possibility that we're wrong. And being open to the possibility that we're wrong is being open to the possibility of dissenting views. He also said that an opinion that is generally false may nonetheless contain a portion of the truth that's missing from the prevailing view. So even if it's kind of, um, even if there's, it's a generally false claim, it might have a kernel of truth that's important to get out into the public sphere. Even if the received opinion be not only true, but the whole truth, unless it is suffered to be and actually is vigorously and earnestly contested, it will, by most of those who receive it, be held in the manner of a prejudice, with little comprehension or feeling of its rational grounds. So even if we had just a truth kind of machine that just spit out truths, right, 
Our ability to vigorously debate those truths is what enables us to understand why they're true. Right? It's important that we subject them to that kind of scrutiny in the public sphere, right? which is different for Mill than it is for us today. The public sphere is well, like on Facebook now. Um, but it's important for us to kind of get at that understanding of why they're true to subject it to um, rigorous, vigorous debate. And in the absence of vigorous debate, the meaning of the doctrine itself, free speech, will be in danger of being lost or enfeebled and deprived of its vital effect on the character and conduct. The dogma of becoming a mere formal profession, inefficacious for good, but covering the ground and preventing the growth of any real and heartfelt conviction from reason or personal experience. Okay? So without this vigorous debate, free speech by itself, okay, as, as, a, as a doctrine, will be in danger of losing its Okay, so on this reading, um, Sunstein wants to suggest that the problem, so this is the diagnosis he gives in his several of his books, the problem with echo chambers is this lack of diversity of viewpoint, okay? And this lack of diversity of viewpoint is epistemically beneficial for the reasons that Mill gives, okay? We need to subject our views to this sort of vigorous debate, and when we are in echo chambers, we're not, right? Everyone's just nodding their heads in agreement. And this will not promote things like truth and knowledge. But I want to suggest that this can't be a general explanation. This can't be the problem, right? Because in many cases, blocking out information and restricting the diversity of viewpoints is actually quite beneficial, right? And from an epistemic point of view. So it blocks out noise, it streamlines the consumption of news and increases the likelihood of acquiring true and avoiding false beliefs. And if sources are added simply to avoid worries about insulation and an illegitimate reinforcement of beliefs without any regard for their reliability, the result is, ends up being far worse. So imagine, suppose I learn about climate change from a reputable environmental scientist. There is only the danger of acquiring false beliefs if it's also we just throw in a couple of climate change deniers in there. Okay? And this gets back to the idea of like, how did you get into the echo chamber in the first place, right? If through substantial research you found that these sources for climate change information are the most reliable ones, okay, it's not going to be at that point epistemically advantageous to just start throwing in some information from climate change deniers. Imagine that you keep responding to those okay, rather than kind of making further progress on um, the questions, the original kind of questions themselves. I think another problem with Sunstein's um, diagnosis here is that it lends itself to a we're all in the same boat kind of attitude. Okay? So we might say that like if I get all of my information about climate um, change from Fox News, you know, or just like political commentators, we might say, and someone else gets all of their information from the Journal um, of Applied Meteorology and Climatology, then well, you're both in echo chambers. You're both only listening to a single those are both problematic, right? And it lends itself to this, we're all in the same boat, right? We're all just in echo chambers. Nobody is really listening to dissenting views. But clearly, the source matters a lot. The echo chamber matters a lot. It matters what's being said in those echo chambers. And I think the third problem with this diagnosis is that it lends itself to simple solutions. So after all of this talk um, in Cass Sunstein's book about the danger to democracy, literally democracy itself is on the line in the echo chambers. His solution is a very simple one. He thinks that we should add dissenting opinion buttons on social media. Okay? So that if you are like kind of scrolling through Facebook and you see an article about um, the coronavirus okay, and dangers, then there'd be a button and it would say like, opposing viewpoint. And you click on it and it would give you the opposing side. And that seems like an incredibly um, simple solution, right, to what many regard as like a very serious problem facing people. That just having these kind of opposing viewpoint buttons is going to be the solution. <clears throat> so what I want to suggest is that um, here is the problem, right? Echo chambers are a structural um, phenomenon. They are content neutral. It's described purely in terms of the structure. So we saw that, you know, basically there's these dissenting voices drowned out, they're echo 
room and it's in an enclosed space. Okay. Um, but fake news, okay, um, is something that is content driven. Okay. So two of the most common criticisms that we see in recent, um, kind of, in our recent news sources is echo chambers and fake news, right? And so um, here's just like a kind of, um, you know, kind of structure versus content point. A recent pundit got a scorecard for the truth of statements made on air, and it ranked all of them, like CNN, and it went through all the different scorecards. But it ranked um, the pundit guess of Fox News as being true only 10% of the time. That was the scorecard that it was given. And so at the same time, um, a recent study from, 2006, um, from the 2016 election showed that 40% of Trump voters and nearly half of consistent conservatives um, name Fox News as their main source of political news. Okay. So what we see is it's not just a question of what the structural phenomenon is, but what is being put into that chamber, right, that matters. Okay. This is especially problematic when you combine it with the empirical research that shows the power of falsehoods. Okay. So falsehoods have been shown over and over in recent research to have far greater power and reach than the truth does online. Okay. Okay. So this is a 2018 study. Sorry, there's a lot of words on here, but I want to get all the, the details out. Okay. Okay. So the study looks at rumor cascades. Okay. And so rumor cascades are unbroken retweet chains with a single common origin. Okay. So that's supposed to be a diagram of a rumor cascade. Okay, to visualize it. So the data set of the study included 126,000 rumor cascades spread by over 3 million people more than 4.6 million times between 2006 and 2017. And here was the result. Falsehoods diffused significantly farther, faster, deeper, and more broadly than the truth in all categories of information. False news cascades reached between 1,000 and 100,000 people, while the true ones rarely extended beyond 1,000 people. It took the truth about six times longer to reach 1,500 people than falsehoods did. And these differences between true and false rumor cascades were especially pronounced when it came to political news. False political news reached more than 20,000 people, nearly three times faster than all other types of news reached 10,000 people. So this was um, kind of like a very um, somewhat surprising result, just the, the, the extent to which falsity spreads deeper and faster on the Now, we might think, okay, well, we can give an explanation of this, right? Perhaps those who spread falsity followed more people, had more followers, tweeted more often, were more often verified users, or had been on Twitter longer. But when we compared, this is the authors of the study, when we compared users involved in true and false rumor cascades, we found that the opposite was true in every case. Users who spread false news had significantly fewer followers, followed significantly fewer people, were significantly less active on Twitter, were verified significantly less often, and had been on Twitter for significantly less time. Falsehood diffused farther and faster than the truth, despite these differences, not because of them. So these authors, in all of these cases, were looking for a structural explanation, right? Maybe it's because you had more influence, you had more followers, and so on. But false rumor cascades are not more powerful than the true ones because of the way in which the information is dispersed. And so I want to suggest that this study supports what I was suggesting earlier, okay? That looking for structural explanations of what is happening online is not the right to go. We have to look for content <coughs> explanations, okay? And so the best hypothesis that the authors have for the study of why falsehoods diffused so deeply and so quickly was a content of one. So false rumors across every dimension were significantly more novel than true ones. Okay? So they display, for instance, much higher information uniqueness along the, the, the dimensions that they were looking at. Okay? And 
false news inspired greater responses from users of surprise or disgust, like these sort of like shocking emotions, like wow, or ugh, right? While true information elicited reactions of sadness, anticipation, joy, and trust. Just kind of more ordinary, not as kind of strong react emotional reactions. <clears throat> and so what the author suggests is that um, The real explanation here is for why falsehood is so successful is because of its novelty. Does anyone know like what like a kind of an example from several years ago that was like a super good example of like one of these false rumor cascades? Pizza Gate. Do you guys remember that? So that one spread like that was a clear example. You can imagine like the novelty of that sort of rumor, right? I mean, you know that they ended up finding someone on their way to the pizza parlor with like a gun in his car, right? Ready to like take out the child pornography that was going on. Or the child exploited. What was it? Trafficking. Trafficking. <clears throat> yeah. So um Pizza Gate is taken to be the kind of a classic example of this kind of rumor that just spreads like wild. Right? <clears throat> okay. So what I want to kind of um look at now is like while well, the changers by themselves in these um, by themselves are not epistemically problematic, but prevalence of fake news is, and it's even more epistemically dangerous when we have echo chambers filled with fake news. Okay, so I want to suggest echo chambers by themselves is not enough. If someone says, someone says it's in an echo chamber, that's not enough to make a criticism. Okay? We have to go, we have to go to the content level uh, criticism. Now, someone might say, I'm not gonna read this quote. It's, it's just it's like kind of a funny one from Bruce Williams. But basically that's how you look at it. Says, it says, look, all that's different right now is the spread of this false information. There's always been people who are spreading rumors. There's always been people diffusing falsehoods. When people are throwing their hands up and saying, oh my gosh, we're, I mean, I'm sure you all read the news. As a, as a social epistemologist, I'm really struck by the headlines, right? Like, people, I mean, like, regular non epistemologists are saying, we're in an episode. Right, but, I mean, like it's like fascinating to see like you know non epistemologists talking about these sorts of epistemic problems. But someone like Williams is going to say, look, it's really just a problem of quantity. Okay, there's just more of it. It's harder to sift through because like we are just inundated with information. But there's always been people in the town square spreading rumors, right? So all of this throwing our hands up in the air, saying, oh my gosh. Like this is a different epistemic landscape is just a bunch of hype, right? This is just, it's just more. And I want to suggest that um, there are some serious new epistemic problems that the current landscape is on so far unequipped to deal with. Okay. Okay, so how did we get to last? Why are we here? Okay, so so um, so just so those of you know, um, so bots are automated accounts capable of posting content or interacting with other users with no direct human involvement. Okay? Just so everybody knows what we're talking about when we're talking about a bot. You like that little social media bot? I mean, it's kind of like, he's like off there like kind of tweeting, right? Um, okay, so I just want to go back to the previous slide. So, uh, one of the things, reasons I said echo chambers are not that problematic is why? Because they're human users. We use, we exercise autonomy, right? You're not gonna, none of you, I would imagine, are so committed to one source of information that if they publish tomorrow, cockatiels are mammals, not birds, that you'd be like, okay, cockatiels are, and just repost, right? Okay, or like, you are seven feet tall, I am seven, right? You, you guys exercise autonomy, right? I mean, to varying degrees, some of you are going to be more critical in your consumption of news than others. But I can imagine every single person in this room is exercising some autonomy in their consumption of information. Bots don't exercise autonomy. Okay? So I spent the whole first part of this talk saying, hey guys, look, echo chambers are not that bad because it's like you and me, right? We exercise autonomy, and that's important for our consumption of information. But I think that when we start looking at the problem with bots, it does raise a unique set of concerns. 
Okay, so a recent study found that 66% of all tweeted links to popular news and current event websites came from social media bots. That's a staggeringly high number. Just look at that again. 66% of tweeted links to popular news and current event sites. The percentage of tweeted links from bots is even higher among certain kinds of news sites. 89% of tweeted links to popular aggregation sites that compile stories from around the web are posted by bots. Okay, 89%. A 2017 study found that a relatively small number of highly active bots, just for you, that's um, one of the very highly active bots right there. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell, like, super, like, quickly not tweeting, right? Um, found that a really a small number of these highly active bots are responsible for a significant percentage of the links to prominent news and media sites. The 500 most active bot accounts are responsible for 22% of the tweeted links to popular news and current event sites. In contrast, the 500 most active human users are responsible for an estimated 6% of tweeted links to these outlets. So these bots are super busy. Okay, so why is this a problem? Bots don't exercise autonomy. They don't have beliefs that are filtering content. They can't be regarded as mere rational for having beliefs in the face of counter because they have beliefs in the first place. They don't assess reliability of sources. They just follow an algorithm and repost. <clears throat> and they don't bear responsibility for what they say or retweet or post, right? Because they don't bear responsibility for the bots. Okay. So what happens is that bots are amplifying voices that are not really voices at all. And so they express views that don't reflect beliefs because there aren't any believers. <laughs> and so echo chambers become seriously problematic when there are what I call fake news approvers, who appear to be posting with autonomy, but in fact are not even so there are fake news, but what I want to draw your attention to are fake news approvers. So when we see that something has a lot of support, that means something to us, right? 200, 2,000, 200,000, 200,000 humans put their support behind this plan. But when in fact the 200,000 voices behind that claim aren't even really voices at all, all of the epistemic support that I originally argued for we get from autonomous dependence vanishes, right? So the way I kind of took you back to square one, right? I argued, look, echo chambers aren't that bad, but actually, when they're filled with fake news, fake news approvers, they're really bad, right? Because all we know is how to assess one another, right? We know how to assess one another for things like trustworthiness, and how to assess one another for filtering beliefs and so on. We don't know how to assess that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what well, we can do. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. They're just automated. Okay, so it's not only fake news that raises epistemic pitfalls for us online, but also what I call fake news approvers. And I want to suggest that fake news approvers are one of the more serious epistemic crises that we're facing right now. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I think that when we look at those two standard diagnoses, like about dependence and uh, a lack of diversity, um, that's, we see that those aren't exactly what is problematic about bots, because there's no simply no relevant beliefs to even be assessed for their dependence on the beliefs of others. And also, bots have been shown to be more than happy to spread a wide range of opposing viewpoints. If I actually look at the data on bots, they just want to create epistemic chaos. I don't know how many of you follow this. I mean, I work on these areas, so I follow all of this. But it's not as though, I mean, there was definitely in the 2016 election far more bots producing anti Hillary Clinton um, messages, but they're also very happy to just create chaos, right? So you actually see them on all different sides of the political spectrum. The point is just to create a lot of noise. Okay, so um, I want to start kind of wrapping up. I'm just what was it? I think we started at five minutes ago. Um, okay, so I want to end with just some suggestive comments. This is not, um, I mean, this is kind of going to be, a, this is like a longer sort of um, conversation, so this is just going to really have to be suggesting. But in, for those of you who are familiar at all with philosophy, a lot of traditional philosophy 
he falls into a category that we might call ideal leader. Okay. And Charles Mills recently, um, so Charles Mills takes the, like, the classic example of an ideal person, John Rawls, in case anybody you know his work. So what distinguishes ideal theory, he says, is the reliance on idealization to the exclusion or at least marginalization of the actual. Ideal theory tacitly represents the actual as a simple deviation from the ideal, not worth theorizing in its own right, or claims that starting from the ideal is at least the best way of realizing it. So it starts with, so I would say that like a classic example of ideal, ideal theory would say, let's start with the notion of a cooperative conversation. Co co conversation where we're all cooperating, okay? And get all of our theorizing out from that, that model, okay? Um, I'm gonna just skip this slide. <clears throat> so an area of philosophy that I've worked in is the epistemology of testimony, where we ask the question, how do we get information from one another? Right? Testimony is not just stuff that's given at the core. We're interested in how do I learn from you on the street? How do I learn from you? a lot of epistemology, the area that I have worked on for a long time, is ideal theory, okay? So let's look at just some representative quotations here. Tyler Burge argues, a person is entitled to accept as true something that is presented as true and that is intelligible to him unless there are strong reasons not to do so. So basically say, if someone tells you something, unless you have reasons to not accept it, you can trust what you're told, okay? Another person, we are justified in accepting anything that we are told unless there's positive evidence against it. Gaining testimonial knowledge normally requires only having no reason for doubt. Okay. The idea that conversation is a cooperative endeavor yields a pair of social norms. The prescription that speakers follow the cooperative principle is that one is a social norm of trustworthiness, and the other one um, is the social norm of trust. So basically, in a conversation, I, unless I have reasons to, to doubt it, I can assume that you're trustworthy, and I'm, I, the default is that I trust you. So these are very representative pictures in this area of philosophy. And I want to suggest that when we take our theoretical starting point, as some of the phenomena that we talked about today, right, when we look at the sheer amount of false news online, Right? Over 80% of tweets to certain aggregate, you know, so at least very popular aggregations are from bots. Okay? When we look at how quickly falsehood diffuses online, how quickly it spreads, how deeply it spreads, our theoretical starting point for thinking about these sorts of questions is really misguided when we start from an ideal starting point. Then you get views like this, right? Except what you're told, unless you have reason not to. Is that the way that we ought to kind of, you know, um, um, enter into a conversation in the online, you know, kind of environment that we find ourselves in? And when you think about it this way, a lot of younger people, I'm the, I'm the mother of two teenagers, most of their conversations are, are on their phones now, right? I mean, like, that's, I mean, it's just a huge part of their lives of, like, this, this, younger people, right? Um, and so these theories of testimony that take this idealization of this kind of cooperative conversation really get it wrong when they don't start from the reality of the kinds of conversations we find ourselves in now. So I want to suggest that we need to take a shift to what I call non-ideal epistemology, which takes as its starting point the complexity of real-life conversations. Okay? And some of these real-life conversations are the real-life conversations that we find online. And so when we do that, I think social epistemology and the work of social epistemology can be very beneficial to how we ought to navigate this space. Okay? And so I'm just going to mention three very, very quickly since I'm just about out of time. So the first is that um, social epistemologists have done a lot of work on providing um, guidance for how to do things like assess credibility, assess the content of what is being said, and to look at different kinds of context assessments. So what kind of context are these comments being made in? What sorts of contents are being you know, kind of asserted? And what sorts of kind of, how can we assess, if at all, the credibility of those speakers? So for instance, there's a lot of work right now in social epistemology about how you assess the credibility of anonymous testifiers. 
right? This is a new phenomenon. We didn't used to have to think so much about assessing anonymous customers, but now, many chat rooms, many places where people are having conversations, they have no idea what the identity is of the person that they're having a conversation. How do you do a credibility assessment? With it? So this is some of the work that comes to the small assessment that we on. Looking at when we ought to object or call out things that are false, so this is another way in which kind of being, you know, kind of uh, interrupters of echo chambers could be really valuable, and looking at um, some issues in applied epistemology, specifically looking at the epistemology of things like um, interrupting echo chambers, and that's an area of applied epistemology. <clears throat> I know I'm just doing a lot of hand waving now, but it's to just kind of suggest that when we start from these messy conversations, rather than the one where everything goes well, I think that we can see the visuals of social epistemology can be very well. Um, and then I just wanted to end with a very kind of well-known comment from George Orwell, in times of universal deceit, which some of us might feel like, that is our times of living in, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Okay, thank you. And true. 
Um, but I think the, like, the question that like, is not pursued enough is, why have you gone to that step, right? And so I actually think that there's a huge epistemic difference between doing research, arriving at the source, and then not being constantly critical of the information that you receive from it, and just doing it for political reasons, or just doing it because you were told to do research, just doing it because you put the quality. Yeah,
drowning out the other voices, not allowing them to participate in the journals and conferences and workshops and discussions, right? And, um, and it becomes a bit of an enclosed space because they're all just bouncing ideas around, you know, kind of within their academic sphere. And, um, but I, 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 Yeah, yeah, I'll try and put this in. I guess the idea is that you are trying to argue that things are neutral because they can be used for a good reason. For the example of an academic space, you want to call out an academic source. I don't think that's quite right because I don't think there's any sources that can be objectively perfect to the idea that they need to be protected. That, that you can measure the level of quality of those sources to the point that you know which ones can be rejected or can be protected. Okay, I think I get it. I mean, so I, I don't think the view is committed to saying that we need objective perfection. Um, I think that um, you can say that this echo chamber is better than this one because this one is grounded in evidence and this one isn't. Yeah. It could just be something as simple as that. It doesn't require objective perfection. It just requires evidence. And so I don't think that we need to have some kind of God's eye point of view on the truth to say that some are epistemically better. I mean, look, the, the, you don't have to kind of like be skeptics to think that like, like imagine you're a juror on a trial, like, right? We just don't think it's a flip of the coin, right? You look at two bodies of evidence and you try to figure out which one better supports the verdict, right? And so that's all I'm saying, like, two different echo chambers, one grounded in evidence and tells a good story about how this is the case, the other one grounded purely in politics, let's say, right? Um, that would be a case in which I want to say this one is epistemically okay, this one not so much. Uh, I know what you mean. 
And sort of uh, similar to the last question, how you mentioned several lot problems. So no autonomy, um, they uh, don't have a set of beliefs and so on. So I was wondering about uh, how the, the, assuming that, that it was likely that a human created the bot, how does the functioning of the bot express the human's set of beliefs and choices and autonomy? And it may already start to answer this, maybe it was a complete answer. Um, but how does, how does that impact that analysis that bots are problematic when there is a human, assumedly behind it, although software probably can create its own software these days with AI and so on? Thank you. Yeah, so, I mean, most of the bot farms are not um, creating bots to just promote their own views, right? It's not as though these people are like, I think that climate change is real. I'm going to make a farm of bots who are just going to get out there and push them, right? Most of it is to just sow chaos, right? That's a lot of the point of it, right? I mean, there is all sorts of evidence that a lot of the interference in our political system is really just to create chaos, right? It's not necessarily, like I said, the empirical data shows there was way more anti Hillary Clinton um, rumor cascades for the 2016 elections. That's undeniable, okay? But it doesn't mean that there weren't any on the other side either, right? And so part of it really is just to sow kind of, you know, confusion and chaos and oversaturated information. So when we're talking about the creator of the bot, if, if the creator of the bot is just a troll, right, then a troll isn't really asserting things that they're like standing by, right? They're just trolling, right? And so I don't think that in most cases we can say, oh, well, these bots are just really representing the assertions of the creators, right? And they're exhibiting like, you know, they're manifesting the autonomy of the creators. Because really the algorithm is like just for the reason, you know? Um, so I think that in that sense, um, there are, like I said, a little bit more like trolls who, I don't think most people think that trolls like always believe what they're saying. They're just trolling, you know. They're just trying to create chaos. Really. I got one. Um, so I was just wondering, because you were talking about how um, echo chambers aren't inherently that are on, like in and of themselves, because humans have this happy ability to you know, exercise their autonomy, right? There's also a lot of research. Like showing that humans don't change our mind, like we don't change our mind very easily, right? And so I wonder if, um, I guess this is kind of a two-part question. I wonder if, like, I know you said to stay away kind of from ideal theory, but in an ideal world, it would seem that we would live in an ever world where we're searching for the truth, and that ever will always be ever true. Um, but I guess ever deeper seems problematic because of humans, regardless of what the cause they're involved because we're so, we seem to be um, unable to change our minds very right often. And I'm just wondering what, like, whether I'm correct in assuming that this still has nothing to do with ever changers themselves. In an ideal world, we would have an energy world that just constantly needs to Yeah, so, I mean, in an ideal world, um, I mean, maybe there would be some opposing viewpoint. They just wouldn't be sprinkled in just for the sake of opposing viewpoints. Do you know what I mean? That's what I object to. Cass Sunstein really does make it sound like, let's just sprinkle in a little falsehood. And that's like kind of epistemically good in and of itself. And what's valuable about dissenting viewpoints is that like there's like reasons backing them. And we're sharing our reasons and we're engaging in a back and forth about them. Not just the sheer fact of the falsehood, right? So that I can just hit an opposing viewpoint and go like, not be, right? I mean, that's not epistemically valuable by itself. Right. Um, and so, yes, there's all sorts of work on polarization, overconfidence. Humans are like, we're, you know, we're epistemically bad in all sorts of ways, right? And I'm quite aware of all of those facts. But I still want to hang on to the idea that like, you wouldn't believe that cockatiels are mammals, just right? You wouldn't believe. So we are exercising autonomy. We 
really are. Right? And you see this when one of the political candidates goes a little bit too far off on an issue that's not part of the, the standard party view, right? That people just object. Right? And so what I'm suggesting is that like this idea that the problem is just this echo chambers that we're all just kind of repeating and amplifying the same thing is not the problem, right? That just saying that we're all in the same boat, this is what happens. They're like, oh, all you academics, you're all in an echo chamber too. And so it's just like, we're all epistemically on par. And I want to say, you know, we need to move away from that criticism and we need to start looking deeper because we're not all on an epistemic par. And I'm not here to make you know, judgments. I'm just here to say, like, if something is based in evidence, something is not, then this is a better view. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's all I want to say. Like, you guys can, like, form your own views about evidence and that sort of thing. It's just that I want to say we're not all in the same boat. Um, I'd like to defend the laws. Wow. <laughs> and it's, it's not I mean, maybe, maybe it's a problem. Defend, like this one is just so Yeah, I mean, right? that's, that's the first example. <laughs> because um, that's like a lot of things to get hang with. Yeah. And, and I'm also thinking that um, I might have trouble, and I think probably I have some, um, and I think as a moment very good thought as to what's happening here. Um, because I think that on a lazy day for me, um, if You're I have my students, oh, I'm worse than that. They, they're much more likely to listen to me, especially if it's about what I'm thinking about it. Because I, I wonder if the problem is bots around the, um, the inappropriate use of certain kinds of algorithms. And maybe this is just, I'm going to tell you the metaphors like a mix, and maybe it's just, you need to get but the, the uh, bots themselves feel like they're just channeling, a, they're just content sensitive, right? So they're just trying to pick out a particular like, keyword search in a simple way, right? But um, it seems like most of the time the bots that seem to be used more effectively are those that are um, targeting their particular content searches toward particular audiences. And if that's the case, they're object sensitive. And I can't form a really good distinction in my own head, except for the practical one, like, here's how they were used in this particular context. But it's a general kind of thing. It seems like you might be able to get them that are complex enough to do the sort of thing that, you know, magically make me click on some cool pair of shoes because it knows that I'm reading something about something. Anyway, it's the same time, right? Well, right. Well, well, that's that's like all the ads and stuff, I mean, it's all curated. Okay, good. Like, if they're that complex, what's the, yeah, super creepy, like that kind of thing. Well, I'll say something. Right. Like so, <laughs> it's the point that we get, like, the, uh, um, that they seem to function as if they're autonomous to the extent that they can discriminate better than I can about what I want. Well, the and bots? Once, yeah, once they start discriminating, once they have an algorithm that's complex enough, it seems like they're better than me when I'm having a maybe a good day. That's right. Oh, they know me better than I know myself. Like so I mean, they know my issues better than I know my own issues. So, so I worry in any event that it looks like they may not be sort of this empty channeling unless we isolate the kind of boss down to their particular kind of algorithm. Really? Yeah. So, that would make sense. Good. It's a really smart boss. Yeah. Um, so I guess what I want to suggest is just that if you think that what is good about humans is their autonomy, then you're just not going to get that with bots. Even if bots are really good at identifying, like, oh, he clicked on this, then he looked at this cute dodo yellow video, which I put on this, that's what I said. <laughs> and, and then I get inundated with cute animals, which is fine. Like, I need that to kind of get through the day, right? But it's like they totally have my number, right? Um, and so, you're, and, and, and yeah, sure. And then they're kind of like, oh, so we're gonna, we know this about you, right? Um, what I'm suggesting is that, like, that's all well and good, but it's just not exercising autonomy in the way that I was suggesting. It gives us epistemic value, right? So they might know you. They might actually be kind of like um, reporting fake news that are kind of like aggregating all of this information in a more sophisticated, rational way than you are, right? If he likes cute animals and he likes, you know, vegetarian food, then he's going to like impossible. Right? And, you know, like they might be able to kind of like infer all of that, like very, in a very sophisticated sort of way. I want to say that's just still not exercising the autonomy that I think is epistemic support to the kind of dependence that I was like, highly, right? It still is just all automated. And so um, that's not, now you might, right, infer and argue that you get some other epistemic goods for bots, from bots. I'm not, I'm not here to say there's nothing valuable about bots. 
What I'm here to say is they don't exercise autonomy. And since the whole first part of my paper was to argue, that's what's, that's what's valuable about you and me, right? That's why when five of us say something, it's more valuable than if one of us says it. That just goes up. But you might think, you might like, yes, I mean, there's like, you know, there's a whole, I mean, huge, huge, huge explosion of interest in the AI. You know what I mean? And what we get from them, how sophisticated they are. I'm not suggesting that they're, 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 they're not good at it. They might be better than they are at this point. But they're not exercising the problem. I will say that right Thank you. I'm over here. Sorry. So my, my question is along the lines of advertising. Why do advertisers think that we'll believe them? If, if so much false information reaches people faster and more people than the truth, and even though it is a bot that might be contacting me if they see me click on shoe ad, what makes them think I'll believe them? And or, or are advertisers completely innocuous of this type of belief or believability or whatever? Yeah, so I think that a lot of when we're talking about advertising, I don't think they care whether we believe or not. They care whether they're speaking to some desire of others, right? So I might not believe these are the best shoes, but there's something I'm like, Ooh, just click, right? You know, I mean, you know those mindless things. I, I spend hours in front of my laptop for hours, right? And like, there's only so many straight hours you can drive to rave or do whatever it is you're doing. So then like, you kind of start, you're like over here doing something, and then you're like, oh, shoes, you know? <laughs> and like, you know, right? I mean, that's what they're counting on. Not counting on me thinking those are the best shoes I've ever seen. Like, I don't have that belief, right? It's just like it's like it's like it's like more primal than that, right? It's just this sort of like gravitate, right? That's what they're I mean, so there's a whole bunch of other like nudges. Are you familiar with all this work in advertising? Right? It's like all they do is they just like move the candy a little bit closer or move the fruit closer to get all of these nudges kind of in radically increase the purchase of this, you know, kind of so there's all sorts of very sophisticated work on what gets us to click, what gets us, and it's not, I believe that this is in fact blah, blah, blah. It's speaking to a lot of other things, just desires and you know, that sort of thing. So we have time for maybe two more questions, maximum.
good evidence for its truth or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, in answering an earlier question, you said that five people believe that gives us more reason to believe it's true. Right. I guess I can think of cases where that makes sense. You know, did something happen? Thank you. 